Over the course of a few months in 1946, several people got the scares of their lives when they stumbled upon different parts of a woman whose remains had somehow ended up uncomfortably far from each other. The crime, which some dubbed the Wisdom Light Murder, became one of the most infamous in Oregon's history during the 20th century. This week on Out of the Past, the Oak Grove Jane Doe. The first discovery happened at 8 o'clock in the evening on April 12th, 1946. A group of friends, H.C. Foster of Portland and James and Mary Reeder of Milwaukee, were taking a stroll down a trail near the Wisdom Island Moorage on the east bank of the Willamette River when they saw something floating in the water. It was wrapped in burlap and reeked with the odor of death. The friends became concerned that someone had wrapped up a litter of kittens and dropped them in the water to dispose of them. Already morally outraged, they opened up the burlap to reveal the body of a woman. Not her whole body, just her torso. There were burn marks on the lower part of the torso that examiners hypothesized might have been caused by a blowtorch, suggesting the victim was tortured. The Portland Oregonian reported that the nude torso was wrapped in black slacks, a dark blue sweater, long union suit underwear, and a grayish-black tweed top coat. The burlap and the clothing had all been bound together with tape, rope, and telephone wire. Almost immediately after the story hit the paper the next day, another gruesome discovery was made. Five tugboat operators found another burlap package floating in the water, about six miles away from where the torso had been found. This one, containing her right thigh and both of her arms, but no hands, was bound with phone wire, just like the first one. And in addition, it was weighed down with sash weights. The men explained to law enforcement that they had seen the package floating there for nearly a month, but hadn't thought to examine it until they had heard about the discovery the previous day. Authorities thought this might be all they would find of the woman. But in July, her left leg was found floating under the Oregon City Bridge. A bundle of what was thought to be the woman's clothing was also found around this time. In early September, part of a scalp was discovered, again in Oregon City. And in October, the victim's eyeless head was found near where the torso had originally been found back in April. This was enough for the medical examiner to determine that she died of blunt force trauma to the head. Her hands and feet were never located. The investigation got off to a rocky start. Clackamas County Coroner Ray Rylance, who examined the first set of remains, made some incorrect assumptions. For example, he thought that the victim was a very young woman, possibly in her teens. This made parents in the area with missing daughters start hounding the police station. Then a more experienced pathologist from the University of Oregon, Dr. Warren C. Hunter, determined that she was 50 years of age or older. Rylance also made the tactless statement that the killer had done rather a neat job cutting up the body. And at least he knew where the joints were. Deputies on the scene at first erroneously identified the severed arms as legs. Shortly after the first bag was found, there was a promising development. Sets of footprints were found leading down to the river, very near to where the remains had turned up. The prints were about a month old, but they were the only ones in the area, and near them was a Scopal brand rabbit feed bag, the same kind that the torso was wrapped in. The prints were of a male who wore a size 10 shoe. Nothing ever came of this, however. A 29-year-old man named Orville A. Schwitzer called the police claiming to know all about the torso murder case. And he was arrested, but he turned out to be a crank. A couple of days after he was released, he went up on vagrancy charges and received a 270-day jail sentence. From this point on, the investigation mostly consisted of working with the Weather Bureau, trying to find where the assailant originally dumped the packages into the water. They tried to calculate things according to the speed of the current and how long she'd been in the water, 
but this ultimately did nothing to help them move forward in the investigation. In early September, they began trying to draw a connection between the victim and a missing woman from Seattle named Marie Nostos. This proved to be a dead end when Nostos' husband informed the police that she had had an appendectomy a few years prior. The torso in the river still had an appendix. Nostos was the closest thing anyone got to a working theory about the victim's identity at the time, at least as far as we can tell from the news stories that survive. In fact, none of the sources I've even seen on the internet reflect that she was eliminated. And it's easy to see why. I almost missed the tiny story that reported her elimination as a relevant link in the case when I was scrolling through the microfilm. As the years went by, however, several names have come up that were at one time or another considered. And as we'll see, some of them seem plausible. Eva Linder Panko met her husband while working on the home front during World War II. Neighbors reported hearing violent fights coming from their residence nearly every night, and they separated after 10 months. Subsequently, Eva purchased a house with her co-worker, Henry Troy Dennis. The house burned to the ground not long afterward, at the same time that Panko disappeared. It was soon established that the fire was set intentionally in order to collect insurance, though there was never any payout. Police located Dennis in Illinois, and it came out that he and his brother were ex-cons. The main argument against her being the body in the river is that she had a glass eye. Medical examiners were fairly certain that the Oak Grove Jane Doe had both of her eyes when she was killed, though both were gone when her head was found. Marie Diffin had been missing since September 1944, when she left her husband and ran off with two men. Her husband waited until 1950 to call the Portland authorities and tell them he thought she might be the woman who ended up dead in the river. As he had heard rumors that she had gone to Portland and she was known to frequent bars there. The obvious question was why he waited so long to report this. He said that Marie's daughter, Colleen, told him that if he didn't, she would. When police questioned Colleen themselves, as well as Marie's parents, they found that everyone suspected foul play. Colleen was sure of it. She said that if her mother wasn't dead, she was sure she would have heard from her for the sake of her youngest son. Diffin's sister also seemed positive that she was dead. She described Mr. Diffin as a liar with a terrible temper. Marie's parents claimed that her husband told her if she left, he'd kill her. One of the men who ran off with her in 1944, George Hart, said the last time he saw her was when she and the other man, Carl Schultz, said they wanted to go somewhere so far no one would ever find them. Maybe Mexico. The biggest problem with Marie as a candidate is that she would have only been in her mid-30s at the time of the Wisdom Light discovery. She was also reported to have a large tumor on her shoulder, from which some people close to her said they were sure she would soon die. No sources anywhere suggest that the torso in the water had a matching tumor. Marion Coffey, like Diffin, was a married woman with a jealous husband. She loved the nightlife and was said to be at a different bar every night. On April 16, 1946, her husband came into one of her local hangouts with the article about the torso being found in the river. He said that he thought it was Marion. He even went to the police station, and when they let him look at her personal effects, he positively ID'd them. She had disappeared on March 18th, he said. He went to work, came home, and she was missing. Coffey denied ever having abused his wife, though he did speak very poorly of her in public complaining about her loose behavior to anyone who'd listen. Theoretically, it would have been possible to identify the victim if she was indeed Marion Coffey. According to Mr. Coffey, she had had part of her uterus removed because of a tumor. There is no information available on whether this was true or if the torso was ever checked in light of this claim. Bessie Carol Nevins was reported missing in a handwritten letter to the police by her sister, Mrs. J. L. Wilson, who said that she had disappeared in 1943 with a man who said he was taking her to Oregon. 
The day before Nevin's disappearance, Wilson was contacted by someone who wanted an address for Bessie, claiming that her Navy-deployed husband wanted to send her some funds. This was out of character for her husband, and when Mrs. Wilson called the Navy the next day, they claimed to have no record of Bessie's husband attempting to contact her. Bessie was a close match of the physical description of Oak Ridge Jane Doe, both in age and appearance. But since the missing person report came from L.A. and was out of the Portland Police Bureau's jurisdiction, they tried to shrug it off. Records indicate that the police didn't look any further into this theory, but Bessie was never conclusively ruled out. J.D. Chandler and Teresa Griffin suggest in their 2016 book, Murder and Scandal in Prohibition Portland, that the victim is a woman named Anna Schrader. She had a long history with the police department and even worked as an undercover agent in the 1920s. She was rumored to have had an affair with Bill Bruning. Both parties were married. Supposedly in 1929, when their relationship went sour after he refused to leave his wife for her, Schrader laid in wait for him outside his house with a gun. They got into a violent altercation in which he broke her ribs. The aftermath was long, complicated, and bitter. There were multiple court cases. Schrader exposed her affair with Bruning, and he lost his job. She also threatened to expose various members of the police department for corruption. She gradually faded out of public view until a few days before the torso was discovered in 1946. An advertisement had been taken out in the Oregonian seeking information on her whereabouts. No one ever saw Anna Schrader again. Chandler and Kennedy make a compelling case. One I find pretty persuasive, but again, it's just a theory. And we are no closer to knowing who the Oak Grove Jane Doe was than we were three quarters of a century ago. It's devastating that this woman was not only murdered, but lost her identity. People that knew and loved her never got to pay their respects because you can't identify next of kin to inform when you can't even identify the victim. People probably walked around with holes in their hearts for the better part of a century, not sure what happened to their loved one. Luckily for us, a society about to enter the 2020s, we have technology at our service that can help us identify victims very quickly. It can give names to victims who have been nameless for decades, and that's amazing. Just this year, two of the Bear Brook victims were able to be identified, when just a few years back they weren't sure if they could even get a viable sample from the remains. Unfortunately for the Oak Grove Jane Doe, there are no remains for law enforcement's new technology to examine. All the evidence from the case was lost in the 1950s, just a decade after her death. It's upsetting to think that she will likely go without an identity for the rest of human history. Most people have already forgotten her story. It's almost entirely faded into the past. If you would like to help victims like the Oak Grove Jane Doe, I would recommend making a donation to the DNA Doe Project. Just in the last year or so, they've been able to identify infamous Doe victims who had previously lost their names, including the Buckskin Girl, Joseph Newton Chandler, and Orange Socks Doe. They do great work. I'll have the link in the description box. If you found this video interesting, please give me a thumbs up and subscribe. That's all for this week. I'll see you next time on Out of the Past.